Good evening, and welcome to another video from theplayersaid.com. My name's Alexander, and I'm here on my own today. Um, today we're taking a look... We're going to look at Unconditional Surrender, which is World War II in Europe. And this is by GMT Games, and this is designed by um, Sal Vasta, and he does a great job supporting this game, and I appreciate a, a designer who does that, who consistently supports this game, and puts out, he'll answer any question you have, if you go on BGG or ConSim, he even contacted me on my website, um, theplayersaid.com, and answered some of the, you know, just gave, gave some tactical advice on some of the ARs that I was putting out. So I wanted to make it a little video. This is kind of a semi-review. I just want to talk about generally this game. Because uh, I'm conducting a, a massive solitaire campaign from, you know, it, it's from like August 1939 all the way through until the end of the war. And this game is, is fascinating. And I just thought I'd want to share some of my thoughts on it. And... and go through a few little different bits and pieces of what makes this game stand out to me, both as a war game and as a solitaire game. Because this game is originally, you know, it's made for two players, but this is very, very easily um, soloable. The game, um, it, it just, the, the activation is just kind of faction order. So the Axis do all of their stuff, and the Western Allies do all of their stuff, and then the USSR does all of their stuff. So you play just kind of best possible move, but the actual mechanics m make this game very, very, very easily soloable. And, and I'll kind of show what I mean by that here coming up. But yeah, a game of this scale and of this scope, I just wanted to kind of put my thoughts out there. This is my two cents on, on everything I've experienced of this game so far. So I want to kind of show you a few bits and pieces on the board and some of the different things and what they look like. So here's a look at a couple of the play aid cards. This one over here is the National Will Tracks. This tracks, you know, your determination to fight the war. And you have the Axis Faction, the Western Faction, the Soviet Faction. Then we have this Factories Track, on which all of the, um, all of the countries within factions that have these factory counters, which in this game, so at the moment, is just, it's Germany, the USSR, England, and, uh, or Great Britain and Italy. France was on here, but France was conquered, so they were removed from the game. And then down here we have the production points. And m more often than not, the production points are tied to these counters, where you'll have smaller nations such as Finland and Turkey or Romania, and they don't have um, these factory counters. You just kind of look in there on the board and say, oh, they've got two factories, they get two production. But, but the larger countries have different modifiers, and so there's a bit more calculations that are needed. This play aid chart over here has... Um, this is a lot of housekeeping and counter management. All the event counters go down here. Then you've got different seated areas here, and for the USSR as well. And then you'll have... If units are eliminated, they can move down to the mobilization from which they can be brought out of there. We've got conquered countries here. You you have conditional events and upgrades, all of this huge pile, it was a big old mess. This is all of the USSR conditional units and tokens. So throughout the game, you know, an event might happen and it calls for, you know, two, two units from a faction's conditional box move to eliminated. So they become available and then eventually they can be mobilized. So this is the original, um, this is the Western faction production card right here. So you have this massive, one of these for each of the factions. That was just the western one, but I prefer using these smaller ones. I've got photocopy laminated ones so I don't just ruin these. But you can have these massive ones if this is all a bit too clumped up for you. Those are, those are very nice, but this is a great, you know, everything kept on two small cards, keeps everything tucked away nicely, and there's a lot of order to this. So I appreciate a game of this scale, they can keep everything very manageable, and the reality is, is this isn't a lot to take care of, it's a number of factories, it's really, really not that bad. The other part of the game that has kind of a lot of counters in it is, this is the turn track, and as you can see I'm in September of 1940 that I'm currently playing through, and we started 
down here in September 1939. So I played through a full year of the game. And basically, I've set up almost everything extra, apart from most of the USA stuff, because they have conditional entry, so I didn't want to set it all up and have to move them all. But, uh, you know, as soon as I move to the next month, all of these counters will go onto that card that we saw earlier. And it's... A lot of these are events. There's also a policy evaluation. So that's going to that's gonna trigger some political things where um, the Nazi-Soviet pact is going to be rethought. Stalin decides, mm, maybe I don't want to be allied with Hitler anymore. And he's going to roll a die to see if that pact ends. The units in there will go into the kind of conditional box or into the mobilization box, dependent on the historical setup chart that I'm using. All in all, though, it's very, very simple and very easy to use. The other important part is the weather conditions. I'm actually not using this one. I'm just going to hoppity skip over here. There's another one over here that I'm using. And at the moment, everything's fair weather, but the weather plays a huge, huge part in this game. Um, the reason there's two weather tracks and actually two turn tracks is you can play this game scenario-based. And so if you're playing just kind of on the eastern front, you'll use that other map and the other turn track and the other weather conditions. I just happen to be using that one because it's tucked away nicely. At the bottom of the map here, um, so it's French North Africa, we have the Diplomacy Cup Marker Holding Box, which is kind of a mouthful. And then we have a, this is a Movement Point Allowance Track. So the unit that's currently activated will have anywhere from 8 to 10 movement points. And you just track them as you go. Okay, the activation's done. Move on to the next unit. Just to just to keep track of you know how far your units have moved or how much points they've expended in attacking. And this is you can use it like a ten-sided dice instead. But this is nice that they've got this printed here. And then you have a just a help helpful track here for tracking DRMs. You just you have an attacker and a, and a defender, and they have a plus and minus side. Just kind of move these up just to help remind you, so I have to re -keep, keep recalculating. I calculate it once, I've got it right now, okay, they have a plus four. And the attackers have a oh, plus three, boom, I roll the dice, I can consult here. I'm not, in other games I feel like I calculate it, roll the dice, and I'm like, oh wait, how many did I have? And this, you got a nice little track for it. The diplomacy holding box is, 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 a, is just one of my favorite parts of the game. So this game deals with not only the military war, but early in the game it deals with the political war. And the scenario tells you how to set up the cup. And basically at the end, once you've done all of your actions on the board of moving and attacking and doing anything like that, each of the factions has the option to spend five resources to either randomly pull a chip from the cup, oh look, it's a pro-axis event, or they can spend five to take one event of political success, for example, and put it into the cup. The caveat being, if there are any no event chits, you have to put one of those in as well. So you can never kind of guarantee yourself a result by just putting this in the cup. So there's always going to be an element of uncertainty putting those in there. But this part of the game is fantastic. If I have a political success, then my faction will put one of those um, kind of pro-faction markers. So let's say Germany pulls a political success marker out of that cup, they will put one of their pro-axis markers in that country's um, capital. So I w you know, I'm going to go ahead and say, oh, let's put it in Madrid. And nothing inherently is going to happen with that. But if, for example, on a subsequent turn, the axis draws another political success marker, or it's possible to have just one of these pro-markers in the cup, and they, and they put another one in Madrid, Madrid will activate part of the Axis faction. And that's actually what's happened in this game, where Spain joined the Axis forces, and they've actually, I don't know if you, you can tell here, they destroyed the fortress at Gibraltar, and are threatening to kind of cut off the Mediterranean to the Allies. So there's this very interesting things happening in this game. But this political part of the game is it's so much fun, because you have to consider, oh, I, I want to buy some of those for my faction to try and do a good thing. But then if you get a no event or a political failure, it's a positive thing for the enemy faction. So something else is going to happen for them and you can hurt yourself in that way. Or you're like, well, there's nothing in the cup. Because you're allowed to look in the cup before you draw and you save more for the Western allies. There's nothing in this cup that's any good because the area seized are good for the USSR. 
they don't do anything for the Western faction or the Allies. So the the Allies have basically nothing in this cup. But if the Allies were to spend five production points to pull these back into the cup, for example, well, that's all they can do that to. The USSR goes next, and they're like, well, heck yeah, I'm going to go for it, because they've got at least two possible good events in here. And so you, you're potentially buying good things just for another faction to take them away from you. So this is just a fascinating part of the game that you end up with. I really, really, really enjoyed the, the diplomatic stuff. And I'm going to kind of pull back a bit here so we can see some more of the board and what's happened in the game. So this is the board at large, and I know it's going to be kind of difficult to see some of the details. So I'm going to pick up the camera here in a bit and we'll take a look. But so much has happened in this game, and we're going to take a look at just some of the colors to see if we can't get an idea of what's going on. So you can see here on the eastern front, we've got a long line of red units. This is obviously the USSR, and they're preparing for the invasion of the east. These gray units here are all the Germans, and this is a mixture of Infantry units, I've got a couple panzer divisions, or panzer armies, and then I've got this two Luftwaffe wings, and then we've got this yellow Italian unit, and I've got the Romanians are part of the, um, they're part of the Axis faction as well. Something that was fascinating that happened in this game, this is, a, and this, my personal game, has been extremely politically active. The diplomacy phases have always been wild, and in a quick chat with Sal, the designer, that's more of the exception rather than the rule. That we had, that the Axis kept pulling, like, pro-Axis markers and political success markers. The Western Allies pulled almost nothing. And that the USSR had a good time pulling um, area seized markers. And they had a good, a good number of political success markers as well. So we have Turkey down here, these kind of ten units. These are part of the USSR, as well as Finland up here. They activated as, as part of the USSR. So really, as the Germans and the, the Axis push forward, they've got to worry about this flank coming in, which is why they're trying to... Hungary is pro-Axis currently. They're trying to kind of... It was one last mad dash to try and get some more allies and units down here to kind of buffer against any kind of counterattack here. And just the further they push in, the weaker they're going to be to this kind of pincer movement. So there's a ton going on that makes the Axis invasion of Norway, which they're kind of setting up to do in the future, a bit more important because they might actually have to worry about moving east as well as trying trying to fight the, the Britain uh, and the Western Allies strategically as well. There's a, a ton of stuff going on. The war in Western Europe went extremely well for for the Axis forces. They invaded much earlier than historically, and it actually took them longer to conquer France than historically, because they, they kind of went into it too early and weren't, very, weren't exactly ready. But at the end, they were able to kind of smash northern France, and Spain activated as an Axis um, country, as we said, and they took Gibraltar, and they're threatening to kind of cut off the Mediterranean and, and see if we can't get the Italian fleet to come out and start... Um, attacking the Royal Navy and seeing what we can do there. But the, the war in the desert here, the Germans haven't aided the Italians at all. And the British are kind of moving along at full steam. So we'll see how all of this works now. This is taking a lot of Italian resources. So they really can't help anywhere else on the board at the moment. There's just so much going on in this game. And as big as this is, this is two, I think they're um, 22 by 34 maps. There's two of them. And at first I was like, that's so big. I'm not going to have space for that. But really, it's actually not that bad. I got a healthy size table. Those play aid cards I showed you earlier are fairly small. And this takes up all the rest of the space. And as big in scope as this is, you can see all the counters on the board. That's it. Each of these stacks is really only one unit. If I've got two, it's, they're stacked with, a, with an air unit, and the air units don't, you know, contribute in the same way. You're not picking up stacks and counting three ground units and combining their values and calculating which one's going to be the lead unit. There's much less of that than there are in other games. Some of the, There are some larger stacks, though, I'll give you that. So we'll take Malta, for example. Malta's got a stack of about five counters at the moment. 
And these counters are sorty markers. Let's get these in focus here for you. Oh, therefore I knock the camera over. Okay. So we have sortie markers, and you can have anywhere from zero to six sorties on an air or a naval unit. So Force H has three sorties, there's a UK convoy, then there's the fort at Malta, and the fort is occupied by this garrison Malta unit here. And the, the sorties are important because um, the fewer sorties they have, this has three sorties, the more combat effective a unit will be. And this is just for air naval, like I said. So this naval unit, any roll that, that Force H makes will be made at a minus three because the sorties represent how exhausted they are, how run down their planes are, how in disrepair they are. And during, you know, so they have the British will have to spend what is a significant amount of resources to remove sorties at the end of each turn. You can remove two sorties from a carrier, it costs you five production points, which is a lot in this game. That's a lot of points. To remove two sorties from an air unit, for example, only costs three production points. And the most you can ever remove in a given turn is two. So you've got to think very carefully about stacking five or six on a unit before you start getting into real trouble. So you want to kind of calculate, well, I want to use... Okay, that's what I ran into with these Luftwaffe units. So I had two here. Um, they did some good attacks against the Royal Air Force, and he put two on himself, and he put two on himself, but then the British were able to attack back, and this Luftwaffe unit ended up with five sorties, so really, he's going to be out of action for a couple of turns, because fighting at a minus three or minus five currently is is very, very, very disadvantageous. It's, it's very, yeah, I would avoid that at all, all possible costs. So here's kind of a closer look at that. So you've got, this is a, a Luftwaffe unit here, this is the second Luftwaffe with their five sorties. And then we've got, I think I believe it's the, first, the fifth Luftwaffe over here with two sorties. Fighter Command's got two, which they were, you know, I think this was at four before the end of the turn, so they were able to remove two of them. And then the first RAF over here has none. They had two and were able to remove those as well. Um, th there's just so much to this game. So let's, I'm going to take a little zoom back. So France has been captured. That was conquered um, just in August, I believe. So about a month removed from that. From France, we'll move down to Spain here. Sorry about the camera, guys. There's nothing I can do about that. So we've got Spain. They just took Gibraltar. And in my mind, what Spain's going to do um, is they are going to try and take Portugal. Because if they take Portugal, we'll start having a lot of control over these sea zones, which helps the strategic war for the Axis faction. The strategic war um, helps to destroy British factories, which reduces their future income. So that's what they're trying to, trying to achieve with that. And then eventually they'll turn south to, to French North Africa and see if they can't help out the Italians, if the Italians are still even in Libya at that point. Because these British forces are starting to... They took Tobruk just in the last month, and then the the third convoy and a Mediterranean fleet moved out of Alexandria and sailed to Tobruk, and then they're heading down to Benghazi at the moment. The Italians spent a lot of resources bringing down reinforcements to try and combat the British down here, and basically in doing that, they... Um, they took a lot of sorties from from Force H, so this is going to take a lot of their resources to get their navy back up and running. But if they can hold here and delay the British and waste a lot of the British resources here, that that will be a positive overall for for the Axis in delaying their reinvasion of um, Europe at some point to get the Germans out. Well, how about you skip over to Turkey here real quick? So the Turks haven't done anything. They set up. And I moved a couple of them across the border here to just to kind of put some pressure on the Axis forces here in the east, just to see what they would do. Um, when war breaks out between the USSR and the Axis, probably they'll 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 charge in just to just to mess with them and, and force the Germans to do something. As a as a kind of a buffer against that, the Germans are trying to influence Hungary and get them to activate as an Axis country. They'll have a couple units, and they're bringing here 
these two infantry units down to try and fend off the Turks in the mountains and things when, when the time comes. The Romanians are here on the south flank of the Eastern Front, and then we've got all of these Russian units. And that seems like a lot of Russian units, but the Russian units are much weaker early on. The Germans have a much, much stronger fighting advantage over them. So we'll see a big push, and then when winter sets in, I know the first winter is going to be very, very heavy, and it's going to be very bad for the Germans. They get bogged down very quickly. Up north, we've got the Finns, and they're part of the USSR now. So Russia wasn't probably going to worry about their northern flank, but now they definitely don't really have to because they can throw the Finns in there to, to do some of their dirty work. Both Estonia and Latvia, Lithuania not yet, but um, Bessarabia down here as well, I think. They, they all ceded to the USSR through that um, diplomacy phase. And in doing so, what that does is that makes those countries part of the USSR mainland. So they get a lot more factories and a lot more production. So that was a, a very, very interesting thing as, as the USSR just kind of grows into this monster. The Axis really have to think, okay, shall I invade quicker to stop that happening? Because as soon as both the West and the East are invaded, you don't do any more political stuff. But I didn't want to do that because I really wanted to explore the political what-ifs in this game. So I delayed invading the East until as late as possible. I also wanted to try and defeat the Western Front so the Germans weren't fighting on two fronts. And that's kind of what's going to happen, but the Eastern Front now is a bit scarier than I think it would have been. Um, right here is Denmark. The Axis just took Denmark and they're positioning to take Norway and Sweden. But mostly Norway because zones, the sea zones 3 and 4 are a big part of strategic warfare. If they can get fighters up there, um, one of the Luftwaffe units, they'll be able to have a positive modifier on the strategic war phase, which is kind of a big deal, which we discussed earlier as well. Um, other little bits and pieces, you have a terrain effects chart over here. This is, the terrain effects are pretty standard. Most of it's very, very straightforward. And actually, I learned all of this just from looking at the um, combat tables, which I'll talk about and show you here in just a second. So I tried to get in as much of this chart as possible. So we have the CRT here. These are all combat modifiers for all different types of um, combats and, and all the results thereof. So it, it, the best part about this game, and I think everyone who's played this will tell you, is that everything combat-wise is this chart right here. Naval combat, strategic warfare, air combat, um, and ground combat is all conducted using the same CRT, which is just a, it's a thing of beauty. Frankly, it is. And you just look at this chart, you say, okay, we're conducting the strategic war during the strategic war phase. And you just look down this line, you say, okay, I'm the Axis faction, I get a plus two if I have a port in the C zone 1, 2, 7, or 9. Oh, look, I control this thing over here. I'm going to do that. And that's, that's kind of the case now that Spain activated as an Axis faction. Well, they now have a port in C-Zone 7, so they'll get a plus two. And, and you'll learn these very, very quickly. The Western faction gains bonuses if the USA is a Western country. And, and you don't actually have to reference these very much once you kind of have a lay of where the map is and how things are the first time you do it. You roll the dice, you add your modifiers... And then you just consult the table. The Germans were the attackers, for example. They, they had an 8, they had a 6 plus 2. And then the Axis, uh, the Allies had a, a 5, they rolled a 3 plus 2. And so the result is DR plus 2. So then you just look down here at the strategic combat results, and you look under DR, you decrease the German factory lost marker value by 1, and you increase the respective Allied factory mar lost marker value by one. Um, and they'll say that for strategic combat, this, this plus two number is, is irrelevant. You just kind of ignore that for the strategic warfare. So you've got a DR, the Germans kind of, the Germans decrease their factory loss marker, which means they have lost fewer factories, yay. Or, and the Allies would move up one because they had lost an extra factory, that's very bad, oh no. 
that's the strategic warfare. The ground combat is very, very similar. You just go run down this list of positives and negatives from plus two for just being German because they're well trained. Uh, minus two if it's a reduced unit. If you have no supply, it's another minus two. If you're a tank unit, plus two. If it's, you know, if you're attacking in bad weather, minus one. If there's any kind of bad terrain, minus one. And you do all of this stuff, and then you just roll on the same table. And you, you just flip flip over here, you know, oh look, we got another DR. The defender retreats. They have to retreat one hex away. Or you get a DD, defender disrupted, which means they'll flip over to their reduced side. Or, conversely, if the attacker rolls really poorly and the defender rolls well, you'll have the attacker stopped, that activated unit can't do anything else. Or attacker attrition, the attacker lo loses a step. Also very, very bad. And, and air, air and naval combat is conducted on this chart here. Again, you just go down a list of pluses and minuses. So convenient to have that printed for you. And then based on what you're trying to do, you say, this, is, this little part tells you how many sorties are assigned. So you rolled a, a DR. The attacker adds one sortie. If we had DR plus two, and the defender adds the number part of it. So attacker adds one. Defender adds two. So that's the start of where these numbers start to come into place for air naval combat. And then you would say, well, this was part of air support. We did DR. Both the attacker and the defender kind of benefit from that combat. If you'd rolled, you know, something else, then it has different effects based on the letters that you received. But everything is conducted on this same combat table. And as you can kind of see, as your numbers are, if you roll equally, a lot of the time you'll have no effects for, for at least combat results. This is my, one of my favorite parts of this game. The combat simple is very simple, it's very streamlined. Once you've done two or three, it comes just like that. The other side of this, one of the best play aids of all time, by the way, and there's two of these in the game, one for each player. You have all of the production costs, you have conditional event triggers. This is a reminder of, oh, when this thing happens on the board, it triggers this big event. Go ahead and look in the rule book for all the details that happen. You've got movement cost here. So each unit starts with either 8 movement points for a leg unit or 10 for a mobile unit, which is tanks and mobile infantry. And then you spend 1 to move in a clear hex, 2 for a rough hex, 3 if you're moving into the central Russia box, which is a separate little holding box. And then there's pluses for if there's rivers, if it's terrible weather, if you're attacking a unit. And we'll cover that here in just a second. You've got national will effects, and you've got a sequence of play. You've got ranges for things. This weather chart is one of the most important charts in the game. At the beginning of every turn, you kind of just roll these three dice. Ooh, the blue zone has a two. Let's say it's May. One through four, we've got fair weather. That's great. The green one in the middle, it's May. One, we'll have good weather. And the warm zone, three, it's May. We are going to have good weather. That's awesome. But then if you look, if it was October, this two over here suddenly is poor weather. This one over here is still fair weather. And this three over here is suddenly poor weather. And when you start rolling very poorly, you'll end up with severe weather across the board. And severe weather divides your die roll. It's, it's very, very bad. So you end up with a five plus two and you divide that and that gives you your total result. And you, combat during severe weather is almost impossible. It stagnates. so. Attacking Russia, you've got to do it during the non-winter months. So I'm going to run through just a quick combat example, and I'm going to try and keep it as basic as possible. So I'm going to I'll do probably just do this one here. So you activate this, the German 16th Army, and that costs you one production point, and that provides you with eight movement points. And remember, there was that green track in the in the corner of the. Um, of the uh, of the map, you would track it with a little token on there. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to use this eight-sided die just because I can't keep moving the camera back and forth. So we'll we'll pretend that it's good weather, it's fair weather. So you move one spot, cost you one movement point, and then we're going to attack this USSR 10th Army, and this is also a clear space, so it costs one to move into this space. And to attack a unit in good weather costs one more. 
So we're now down to five, and we'll do an attack. And the attacks in the good weather are fa fairly simple. The Germans add a plus two die roll modifier because they're German, and the Russians add nothing because their training is not as good. And then you're going to roll two dice. Let's just roll these and see what happens. Well, that's very bad. <laughs> So the Germans have a 6, plus 2 is 8, and the Russians have a 3. And remember that combat results chart that I just gushed about? We'll consult that here real quick, if I can even show it in here. Ooh, I don't know if I can. Basically, um, if I go 8 for the attacker and 3 for the defender, we have DD, defender disrupted, which means the defender is going to be flipped over, and then they're going to have to retreat. And retreat is as simple as putting one hex between the attacker and the defender. So they'll move here. Because this is mobile combat, which means they're moving and attacking, the Germans move into this spot here. They already paid for moving into there, if you remember beforehand. And now the Germans can go again. They've still got five movement points. So they'll try their luck attacking again. Anytime you enter an enemy zone of control, which is any hex surrounding an enemy ground unit, you have to either stop your activation or keep attacking. So these guys are going to keep attacking, obviously. So they, they will attack this 10th USSR unit. They're plus two for being German. And now they're plus two. No, they're just plus two for being German. The, the Russian units are actually, the defenders, minus two <laughs> for being reduced. So we've got a six, seven, eight, and this is a five minus two is a three. So we end up having the same thing there. And so they're going to be defender is a DD result. So they'll be disrupted and they'll be off the board. And the Germans get to move in again. This move costs another, it's an empty, it's a, like a, there's no rough terrain. So an empty clear space and it was good weather. So that cost them five. Uh, they're here. They still have three movement points. So they're going to try their hand again. Uh, let's see, they'll, tr they'll try attacking here into this forest, just for the fun of it. So they are plus two for being German. They are minus one because it's a forest, so they're only a plus one net result. And the Russians, for example, are, are just a, a zero. Now, what we'll do with this combat is that we'll say... The fourth Luftwaffe are one, two, three, four spots away from the combat hex. So they are going to activate to try and add air support. If you have air support in clear weather, you get a plus two to your die roll. The Russians aren't happy about that, so they'll activate their first air unit to try and counter that. So whenever you have two air units activating for air support, you have air combat first, and then you see who gets the bonus, if anyone. So Germans get a plus two for being German. Russians get a plus nothing. Oh, that's not good. So we have eight to four. And eight to four is just over here. We have DR plus two. And as we said earlier, what that means is, let's see if I've got the counters here. Let me go grab them real quick. So the DR means the defender or the attacker, which is the Germans in this case, adds one sortie. And the defender adds sorties equal to that number, which was DR plus two. And then the DR means, if we consult here, well, that's very difficult to show you. So the DR, so attacker adds one sortie, defender adds sorties equal to the number. And this was for air support, DR, attacker, and defender each receive the air support ground combat DRM, which is a plus two in good weather. So the Germans are plus two for being German, plus two for air support, minus one because they're attacking into a forest. So they're a net plus three. And the Ger Russians are just plus two from the air support. So we roll the dice. The Germans are a five. The Russians are a five. And then we consult that table. Anytime the results are, uh, are even that way, you can just be guaranteed that it's a no result for ground combat. So we have five to five. This diamond means that nothing happens, which is listed right here. No effect, the combat's over. So to attack into this hex, it costs them one, two 
for the so it's one for the hex, one for the forest, and one to attack the unit in good weather. So they had three movement points that used all of them. They've got nothing left. The sixteenth army is done activating. So now killing and destroying that USSR unit's pretty unusual. Um, it's, I feel like you do less destroying of units, more of just pushing back and creating pockets. But, you know, that happened right there. You just saw that. So, what you'll find in this game is you activate one unit to their completion, and then you move to the next one. You don't do, I'll do a little bit here, and a little bit there, and a little bit back here, and a little bit there. So what you find is, is this game rewards you just for kind of gutsy play and playing through intuition. Because this unit might push all the way in, and then you're like, oh, snap, they got a lot further than I thought they would. Better use some of these other units to kind of back them up and make sure they can't get cut off and out of supply. And what happens is you, you'll just push and push and push and then they'll push back. And so you have this back and forth and you'll have like a net gain either way or they'll have a kind of a stalemate of they pushed you out and we pushed you back in. And that happens in, in Paris during the, the invasion of the West. Paris went back and forth, back and forth in a turn and then the net result was that Actually, nothing had happened other than units had been damaged and production points had been spent. The other form of combat that we have here is assault combat, which is a lot slower and a lot more sluggish. And I don't know if I would... That's the kind of thing you want to do if you have um, combined country armies or armies with weaker units. If I'm the Germans, I want to do that kind of mobile combat and just push, 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 push. Because their plus two modify can overcome a lot of things and it gives, makes them very powerful. But, for example, the Romanians that don't benefit from any of that, they have no positives. Inherently, you'll want to consider doing them as part of combined assaults or things like that. With assault combats, you can move. So, you know, they, they move and then they can attack one time or one time only. Or, if they're already adjacent to a unit, they just you just pay their activation cost and you say, we're going to assault. And that's all you do. So assault combat, it's, it's much more stagnant, used for breaking lines, or if there's that bad weather, you can attempt to do it then. It's a bit more powerful because what you do is, you have a lead unit, I'm using the German one, he gets his plus two, he's attacking here. Then you just get a plus one from each of the other units attacking. So the reality is, is you might get like a plus one or two from that. If you have tanks assaulting with you, they give you an extra little bonus. But that's a way to, to get kind of mediocre forces to combine their strength and make one powerful attack. But again, it's kind of expensive and it's very stagnant. And this game, I feel, rewards mobile combat and outmaneuvering. If you get outmaneuvered and cut off from supply sources, You'll get into low supply, which gives you negative modifiers. It enables you to not be able to gain any kind of re replacements. So if you're reduced, you can't get back to full strength. And then it's much easier for the enemy to, to finish you off and, and destroy you. So that's something you want to try and avoid. And assaults aren't really conducive to that. There are situations where assaults are um, imperative, where you have to use them. And let's just hop and skip over here. Well... I don't have the Maginot line anymore because the French were wiped out, but assaulting fortresses like the Spanish did against Gibraltar, you have to use assault combat to, to break a fortress. It's impossible to just do mobile combat. You have to kind of, you know, it's, it's, you have to set up your cannons, do a big assault. You know, it takes time to take down a big monster like that. So I just wanted to finish up by saying that I love this game. Um, I have played many hours of it, and I've only scratched the surface. Now this is, if you're a purist World War II kind of simulator, you can play this historically, but this may not be the game for you because this presents a ton of what-if scenarios. You know, every country outside of Germany, UK, France, and USSR, every country's involvement in the war is entirely kind of up in the air you get to decide who joins the war by either invading them and conquering them, in which case they won't be, or trying to use diplomacy to get them on your side first. So there's just so much to explore, and that makes the replayability of this game immense. Now, 
this game is also very big and if it's long, am I going to play this a hundred times in my lifetime? I don't know if I'll get that many. I would love to because I love this game. The combat's quick, it's simple, the counter density is low, which means you're not, stack management's not that big of a deal. Everything moves very quickly and things can change just like that. It, the game's exciting and it's dynamic. That's something that, that I love about this game. You, you could um, house rule kind of very, very, very historical, say, well, this event will happen here, and the Germans have to invade on this date, they have to take this thing on this date, and, and line it up that way to simulate World War II. But I think that does a disservice to the engine that Sal has made for this game. Um, you can read my series of ARs on this Solitaire campaign that is ongoing as of um, the middle of 2017. Um, for a more detailed look at how the campaigns have progressed and the different combats that have happened and the different turns and twists that the game's taken. Those are going up. I mean, they're going to continue for the next foreseeable month as I play this out. But I would highly, highly recommend this for almost anyone because the difficulty level is not really that high and the playability is just through the roof and it's a very rewarding experience. Solitaire would highly recommend this is a 10 out of 10 Solitaire game. Really, there's one tiny mechanic in the game that was not Solitaire friendly, but you just kind of use your brain, and that's for using these event modifiers for comments. Use them when it's smart to use them, and if you can't decide, flip a coin, basically. But usually it's very, very intuitive if you're like, oh, this is a very, very important combat. I should probably commit a marker or two here, and, and that's really the only aspect where you could say maybe not solitaire friendly but absolutely everything else is everything's open and you just do best possible move and see what happens because this is going to be a wild ride and that's my you know a few thoughts at the moment on unconditional surrender by gmt games well, thank you very much for watching